I, uh, I'll tell you that this book, the book of Amos, is a challenging book to, to read, to teach, to preach from. And today there's some disturbing stuff in, in this, and uh, we'll see how much we can dive into it. But many of us remember the O.J. Simpson trial and verdict. There was a lot of controversy. There was, there was spectacle involved in that whole process. And, and it seemed to many that the evidence was just overwhelming that O.J. Simpson was guilty of murder. But when the jury came back, they found that he was not guilty. And the divide was immediately exposed. Poll after poll showed that the majority of white Americans thought that he was guilty, while the majority of black Americans supported the verdict. And at that time, most black Americans would simply explain Simpson's guilt or innocence really is not the issue for them. Because if you have ever driven through a nice neighborhood in a new car and been pulled over simply because that's what you were doing, or if, or if you've seen up front the personal injustices that exist solely because of the color of your skin, the issue was not O.J. Simpson. They applauded the fact that the justice system finally worked for a rich black man like it has worked for years for rich white men. In a sense, although we say justice is for all, it doesn't always work that way. Now the problem is not that most of us don't believe in the concept of justice is for all. The problem is that many, the concept is also the reality. And to suggest otherwise can make you very unpopular. Just ask the prophet Amos. Because Amos preached to a nation that lauded justice, but practiced just us. And today I want to look at two of his harshest sermons. So click your seatbelts. Chapter 4, verse 1. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan on Mount Samaria, you women who oppress the poor and crush the needy, and say to your husbands, bring us some drinks. The sovereign Lord has sworn by his holiness. The time will surely come when you will be taken away with hooks. The last of you with fish hooks. You, you will each go straight out through breaks in the wall, and you will be cast out toward Harmon, declares the Lord. Now, the setting for this particular sermon was probably some exclusive marketplace where Amos sat and watched the pampered darlings of the upper crust do their shopping. Because every city has a place where the wealthy women go to shop. And as he watched them do their thing, a metaphor came to his mind of the sleek, well-fed cattle moving contentedly about their pasture. He refers to the cows of Bashan. Well, if you look up Bashan in your Bible dictionary, you will find that it was a land just east of of the Sea of Galilee that was famous for its pasture land and its livestock. And several times in the Bible, you will hear references to the fat and healthy cows of Bashan. In Amos's day, fatness was a sign that you were doing well. Still is. Some of us a lot more well than others. <laughs> You can go to many places in the world today and not see any fat people. So he looks at these women 
And he says, you fat cows of Bashan. Now, I've been preaching for a while, but let me just say something to anybody considering starting out in ministry. If in your sermon you start out with calling women fat cows, (laughs) probably ought to have a second job. But Amos charges that their fatness was the result of their oppressing the poor and crushing the needy. But that raises a question. In what way were these women guilty of that kind of a travesty? In chapter 5, he says the poor cannot get justice in the courts. They, They can't pay for the lawyers you rich people can pay for. But the women weren't running the courts. Chapter 8, he says, you're cheating the poor in the marketplace. You, you have these scales and you're, you're ripping the poor off. But the women aren't in charge of the marketplace. So how were they guilty? See, Amos says you're guilty because you promote injustice by putting demands on your husbands to maintain your highly expensive lifestyle. These women weren't aware, and apparently they did not care, how their desire for more was impacting their community. Look again at verse 1 from the Living Bible. You women who encourage your husbands to rob the poor and crush the needy, you who never have enough to drink. In other words, your lust for the good life is making life bad for the people on the margins. Because whenever materialism is the predominant value of a culture, somebody pays the price, and usually it's the have-nots. Now please understand, it did not keep these women from going to church. Because if you read the next two verses in Amos 4, he talks about how God is not going to accept their offerings. These women were faithful church goers. Maybe that explains where we get the phrase, holy cow. I I don't know. But Amos says, God wants nothing to do with your worship one day a week. Because of how you live the other six days. In fact, there's a little insinuation here that the Hebrew would would have caught. But we miss it. Because one of the things back then that denoted the rich women was their jewelry. In in particular, rings that they would wear in their nose. So Amos closes his sermon by saying, you love that jewelry? God's got some jewelry for you women. It's going to be hooks. And that's what he's going to use to take you into exile. And by the way, the Assyrians were a brutally infamous people who would march their captives in train literally by hooking them through their noses tied to a rope. Even at times they were known to put a hook through the 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 roof of the mouth into the sinus cavity and making people march. That's what happened a mere 40 years after Amos preached these messages. Now, do you think the women listening to this actually liked that sermon? What do you think they did? Well, they went home and they told their husbands about it. And the husbands showed up to confront Amos. But that was okay because Amos had a sermon ready for the husbands. So he preaches in Amos chapter 6. Woe to you who are complacent in Zion. And to you who feel secure on Mount Samaria. You notable men of the foremost nation to whom the people of Israel come. Go to Kalna and look at it. Go from there to Great Hamath and then go down to Gath and Philistia. Are they better off than your two kingdoms? Is their land larger than yours? 
You put off the evil day and bring near a reign of terror. You lie on beds inlaid with ivory and lounge on your couches. You, you dine on choice lambs and fattened calves. You, you strum away on your harps like David and improvise on musical instruments. You drink wine by the bowl full and use the finest lotions. But you do not grieve over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore, you will be among the first to go into exile. Your feasting and your lounging will end. And keep in mind, back in that day, that, that people would eat meat typically about three times a year. The poor never ate meat. And these folks were having a steak every night. This is kind of like the, the sermon he preached to the women. You, you see this individual affluence coupled with Social indifference. These notable men are at ease in Zion. But it is the ease of idleness and apathy when there was so much good that needed to be done. Good that they had the resources to do. But instead, they traded the pursuit of altruism for the religion of consumerism. In verse 5, the Living Bible says, You care nothing at all that your brothers need help. Which is their way of interpreting that phrase. You do not grieve over the ruin of Joseph. Now, I think that's probably intended to be a, a reference back to the story where Jacob's sons were very jealous of Joseph. And so what did they do? They threw him into a pit and while he was in the pit what did they do next they ate here's their brother down in a pit and they are eating a meal amos says you you should be sick about what is happening in the culture but instead you're just putting another steak on your grill so again, there is a pun that the Hebrew would have noticed. He said, you, you, you notable men who use the finest lotions are going to be the first to go into captivity. Because all three of those phrases have the same word in Hebrew. He says, you're the first men. You use the first lotions. You're going to be the first God chooses to receive judgment. Now, please understand that Amos is not saying that only the rich are the spiritually corrupt. To say that, that poor people are oppressed is not the same as, as saying that poor are intrinsically righteous. No, the poor have the exact same sinful nature as the rich do. But why is it that he's focusing his message to the rich? Why do all the prophets seem to do that? Because, and this is very important, they put the burden of justice for all on the shoulders of the rich and powerful because they are the ones with the resources to do something about it, not the poor. Societies do not rot because people do bad. They rot because people with the capacity to do good don't. Instead of a burden for justice, the people of means accept without question the advantages of societal systems that are just for us. We don't ask the hard questions because... We get to go to the best schools. We get to have the best lawyers. We get to have the best health care. And the system is working for us. So we put another steak on our grill. That's why the prophets rail against the rich. You are the ones who have the influence to make this better. But you don't. Because it's working so well for you. But you see, we are the church. We are 
the conscience of the community. So how is it that we are to respond? And so with the time that I have left, I'm going to suggest what justice means for those of us who are the people of God. Just a couple of suggestions. And the first is this. Let us formulate a healthy theology of justice. We have theologies of so many other questions that are critical, but not many of us can say that we grew up really in a church that talked a lot about the issue of justice. And in the Bible, justice is primarily an economic question. It begins with the understanding of who it is that owns what. Thankfully, the Bible answers that question for us very early on in the very first verse of the Bible. God made it, and it doesn't belong to you. And because God owns all of it, he has very strong opinions on how we are to steward what it is that he owns. And here's my belief. God has made enough for everybody to have some. And injustice is depriving anyone of open access to God's creation. That's why when you read the Torah or the law of Moses, God challenged the absolute right to property and he placed limits on the accumulation of wealth. You could not take advantage of a man who was having a hard time, take his land from him as a, as a way to pay the debt, and then keep his land forever. God just wove into the law the understanding that everybody is able to have access to the goodness of his creation. Now obviously, fallen man does not feel that way. Did you realize that the three richest men in the world today collectively have more wealth than the gross national product of the 48 poorest countries in the world? So I read all of these angry atheists writing all of these bestsellers today about, well, if God is real, then, then why does he allow all of this unnecessary suffering to go on in the world? Wait a second. Is the suffering due to God's lack of provision or man's lack of compassion? Justice means everybody has the opportunity to enjoy the goodness of God. So we start there by, by at least opening up our Bibles to study the subject of justice and how it applies to us. Second point, let us cultivate a greater burden for those with burdens. Because even if we don't mean it to, even if we don't mean it to, affluence can, can easily distance us from those that actually have a burden. We, we can stay in environments where our consciences do not have to be exposed to the plight of people that are on the margins. Of course, it helps if we can keep our minds preoccupied with our latest purchase. That's why we need the prophets. That's why we need to read them. That's why we need to hear them. That's why we need to let them have their place in the church because they call us back to the very heart of God. Deuteronomy chapter 15 beginning in verse 7, says, If there is a poor man among your brothers in any of the towns of the land that the Lord your God is giving you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted toward your brother. Rather, be open-handed and freely lend him whatever he needs. Be careful not to harbor this wicked thought. The seventh year, the year for canceling debts, is near. So, that you do not show ill will toward your needy brother and give him nothing. He may then appeal to the Lord against you and you will be found guilty of sin. Give generously to him and do so without a grudging heart. Then because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in everything you put your hand to. There will always be poor people in the land. Therefore, I command you to be 
open-handed toward your brothers and toward the poor and needy in your land. Listen, this is the very heart of God. You remember the story that Jesus tells in Luke 16 about the rich man and Lazarus? The rich man was sent to hell. What was his sin? We don't know of any immoral activity in his life. We don't know that he was dishonest in business. The only thing that we know about him is that God put into his world right at his gate. A man that was poor, that he could help, but he didn't. Now, we live in a culture, and all you have to do is go to the magazine racks and the grocery store, flip on your TV to the entertainment channels, and you will see that we always think too much about those with too much and too little about those with too little. The church exists To counter the culture. And this is where I'm going to get very practical with this particular message. I I had planned to go deeper into the text than I'm doing right now. But I believe that God has presented this church with an opportunity to do some real good in a real way right now. 